Well, good morning. Welcome to our third science exploration series of the 2023 football season. My name is Samantha Keller, and I am the web and social media specialist in the Dean's office in the College of Science. And we love to host these lectures on game day because there are just there's so much to celebrate on campus, both in science and sports. So whether you have been to a science exploration series before or this is your first, we're so excited to share what we are learning in the classroom and in our research laboratories. An interdisciplinary team of scientists and sports performance professionals help keep Notre Dame student athletes competing on the field, the court, and the pitch. This morning, we're going, to, we're going to learn how data analysis, modeling, and statistics optimize our athletes' well-being and performance. Now, I'm not a data science, scientist or a mathematician, but I think what that means is that we're about to learn how science is a key to a fighting Irish victory over Ohio State tonight. Yes, Does that sound right? <laughs> Jonathan Howens. <laughs> We have one, we have one contrarian here. <laughs> Jonathan Howenstein, the Robert and Sarah Lumpkins Collegiate Professor, is here to help us explore how science aids sports performance. Jonathan is the chair of the Department of Applied and Computational Mathematics and Statistics, or as we like to say, ACMS. He earned his PhD from the University of Notre Dame in 2009, and he joined the faculty in 2014. Jonathan, Jonathan's research focuses on developing numerical methods for solving nonlinear equations. His research has been honored with various awards, including a DARPA Young Faculty Award, Army Research Office Young Investigator Award, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, and the College of Science Research Award. This collaboration between science and athletics is helping student athletes perform at their highest level, and it's a collaboration we're really proud of. We are so excited that you have joined us to learn more about it. Let's welcome Jonathan Howenstein together. Thank you, Samantha. Hopefully I can live up to that wonderful introduction make sure everything is, uh, is working correctly here. So it's great to see everyone. It's great to have you here. Thanks for missing the last hour of game day outside to uh, come into a, a lecture series. Most of the numbers that will show up in this talk are on the first slide. So don't worry if you're afraid of numbers, they're mostly on this first slide as decoration. The whole idea of this talk is sort of to tell you behind the scenes what we're doing, how we're helping our athletes avoid injuries uh, and compete at the, at the highest level. Uh, so let's start with uh, a team. So just like there's so many different players on the team, you need a great quarterback, you need an offensive line, you of course need a punter and the long snapper. No one can go without a good long snapper. So the football team has a, a lot of different uh, specialty areas in our interdisciplinary team, we also have a lot of uh, specialties. So of course we have mathematicians, statisticians, data scientists. We also have anthropologists, physical therapists, physiologists, and we could not do this without the athletics uh, support. So we have strength and conditioning coaches as well as athletic administrators helping us. Uh, so we have grad students, undergrad students, postdocs, staff, faculty, and then external uh, consultants. Uh, so this here is Megan McGinty. Uh, she's currently a junior here at Notre Dame. And her goal is to be an orthopedic surgeon after uh, graduation. So she wants to go to medical school. And she is a fantastic uh, researcher to help us in this, uh, in this work. And this person running really fast is Casey Matoyer, and he's our uh, sports performance associate uh, that we hired here to jointly between ACMS and athletics. And so I'll say more about uh, this research project. And we're funded by uh, the National Football League, and so I'll talk about our research with the National Football League uh, in a little bit. So let me say a few words about myself. I grew up born and raised in Ohio, so 
<laughs> My parents are also here. They did not just say, <laughs> So I was born and raised in Ohio. I did my undergrad at University of Finley in Finley, Ohio. And then I went down to uh, Miami to do a master's degree. And after Miami, I had a choice to make, where to go for my PhD. And so I visited Ohio State, Purdue, and Notre Dame. All wonderful, but just like Notre Dame, we ignore the Big Ten and stay independent. <laughs> and so I came uh, to Notre Dame for my PhD. After I graduated five years later, they hired me back as a faculty member. And so it's been, it's been a fantastic ride. So yes, I've been to Ohio State. Yes, uh, I could have went there, but uh, I think I made the right choice and, uh, and came to Notre Dame. So I was hired back, as Samantha said, in 2014. Uh, so I officially started July 1st of 2014. And a few months later, September of 2014, this football game was announced. And so I circled it on my calendar nine years ago, September 23rd, 2023. We're going to have a party at my house. We're all from Ohio. Let's have a good time. Little did I know nine years ago I'd be giving this lecture. So it's, it's fantastic. But this has been nine years in the making. And there will be about 60 people at my house later today. So it'll be a fun, fun time uh, there. So as Samantha mentioned, uh, I'm the department chair of ACMS. And so what we're trying to do is apply mathematics, computational modeling, statistical analysis, data science to impact critical problems. So we collaborate with other scientists, engineers, uh, to be able to apply the data science and statistics to them. One of the nice things is that in sports, there's an abundance of data. There's data everywhere. So this Garmin watch that I'm wearing is collecting data on me right now. And I'll look and see my heart rate afterwards, see how it's, uh, how it's going. Uh, same thing with these whoop bands. These will measure uh, heart rate, sleep. So you can see how you're performing in performance, also in uh, practice. See how practice is relating to the game. Uh, Megan here is putting uh, sensors on Casey. And so we're measuring. Uh, the running, uh, so we put on feet, knees, and then there's some on the backside. And so we, we measure sort of the kinesiology as, as the athletes are running. So we do this uh, with the football players as well. So we can get a good idea of sort of how their motion is going on, on straight line sprints. Uh, you might have seen uh, Kyler Murray. Uh, this picture made uh, the news a couple months ago, I guess in August, about a month ago. About, uh, so this, all our players are wearing this. Uh, this is a GPS system. So this measures uh, acceleration, velocity, uh, total uh, number of sort of yards run. So we can get a good sense of how fast they're running, how much they're stopping, how fast they're changing direction. And then soccer is using this uh, to also sort of measure how people are, are moving around the pitch uh, there. Uh, in hockey, hockey is inside, so you can't do a global positioning, same with basketball, and so they actually have a local positioning system inside of, of the hockey arena and can do similar things. It turns out that the local positioning system is much more accurate than the GPS system. So it's actually better to be inside than, than outside. Uh, Hawkeye is used uh, in uh, tennis, and if you watch the US Open recently, there are no more umpires. It's all electronic. So every line call is made electronically these days uh, based on uh, mathematical modeling of how the ball is moving to be able to see if it hit the line or not. And now let's uh, highlight this one picture here. So if you watch any of the NFL broadcast, of course, uh, Amazon is uh, partnered with the NFL to be able to try and sell their cloud service and they'll talk about catch probabilities and you know, sort of how amazing things were. My favorite class to teach here at Notre Dame is probability. So I love teaching probability. And this is my favorite toy that I take to probability. 
it, yes, it's seen its better days. But the nice thing about this is it's big enough, I can throw it to people. Scott, can you catch? There you go. <laughs> awesome. And now you can roll it. And then we would talk about what is the probability that it's a five? And the answer is one sixth. It's a three. So, good. So the probability that it was not a five is higher. That's what you'd expect to happen. So the idea of measuring probabilities of catches and things like that, of course, you can never measure that. It's completely unknowable. What's the probability this is, person's going to make this catch? Completely unknowable. But what you do is you build a mathematical or statistical model, and then in that model you say, well, it was 17.6%. So there's this famous quote, all models are wrong, some are useful. So the answer is not 17.6%. It's in that model it's 17.6%. But the idea is this was an incredible catch that they made. So that's sort of what we're trying to think about. Is, is it highly likely, highly unlikely, and sort of balance in between uh, those things. And so everything is going to be based on, on probabilities. We're measuring risk with the athletes to be able to see, are they at high risk for injury? If they are, we make corrections. If they're at low risk, then we continue on, on those paths. So everything is going to be based on, on probabilities here. So let's think about what is sports performance at Notre Dame. So sports performance at Notre Dame consists of six things. There's the strength and conditioning coaches, the doctors, the sports medicine. There's the nutrition side, and then we have the psychologist. There's the gold center, so grow, lead, and do. And then there's the six pieces, the data and analytics piece. So this is the data and analytics piece that ACMS connects with athletics on. So we're providing uh, the ways to be able to analyze their data, make predictions, and then iterate from there. As a faculty member, I'm judged based on the new knowledge that I generate. How many papers did I write this year? And so as a faculty, my goal is to create new knowledge. Write papers, develop new knowledge, share it with the world. And so part of this is sort of sharing what we've been doing. As a university, we want to create opportunities for our students. So we're creating opportunities for our students in real world data. In the classroom, data looks pretty. It always works out the way you want. When you go out and try and collect data from an athlete, they wear it wrong. Uh, they take it off before they're supposed to. They step on it and they break it. Everything goes wrong. How can you take advantage of that? How can you recover from it? How can you ignore the, the bad pieces? So we're giving our students real world experience to be able to look at the data and analyze it so that when they, after they graduate and go to jobs, they know how to, how to handle these things. Uh, within the past two weeks, we, la we launched a student analyst team that's joint between ACMS and athletics. And so just like all the major sports have their analyst group, Notre Dame's gonna have its own analyst team here where the coaches can come in, ask the students questions, the students will work on it and return the answers to them. So look for new ideas or new uh, results coming from this team in the, in the future. And then on the athletic side, of course, the athletics is looking for a competitive advantage. Uh, there was a newspaper article that my mom just shared with me that says, what is gonna be the difference between today's game? And it's probably gonna come down to a few plays. There's gonna be a few plays today that will really determine the outcome. If those few plays go in Notre Dame's direction, we're probably gonna win. And so how can we impact a few plays in the competitive advantage so that they are more likely to go Notre Dame's direction? So athletics is really looking at how can we use the data to create a competitive advantage to be able to impact on the margins there. Fantastic. So let me just give you a very simple baseball analogy. So baseball has used statistics for over a century probably. 
And one of the first things that they looked at is, should I bat left-handed or right-handed versus a left-handed pitcher or a right-handed pitcher? And so here's data over 13 uh, major league seasons, 1.3 million at-bats, and you can compare uh, sort of total productivity there. And so you get a really nice, simple uh, table here. And so what you should see is on this diagonal, those numbers are higher. So that says the batter has an advantage. A left-handed batter and a right-handed pitcher, the left-handed batter is going to have the, have the advantage. So if it's opposite, the advantage goes to the batter. So when we're on offense on baseball, we want to have opposite hands. And Notre Dame's baseball team will have a slight advantage. If they're the same, so left-handed batter and left-handed pitcher, right-handed batter and right-handed pitcher, the advantage goes to the pitcher. And so when we're on defense, we want to set it up so that we have the same hand when pitching. So this is a very simple illustrative example of sort of how to get a slight competitive advantage by just looking at some data. And this has been used in baseball for hundreds of year, uh, 120 years probably uh, there. So really well known uh, advantage. Okay, if you walk into any of the sports performance offices at Notre Dame, you'll see a sign like this on their desk. So I walked into someone's office and took a picture on my phone of this. Together we holistically prepare every Notre Dame student athlete to perform like a champion. So every time our students come into strength and conditioning, sports medicine, sports nutrition, or the Gold Center, they will see this. We're preparing them to perform like a champion, and we expect them to perform like champions tonight. Why I got really excited about this is, as Samantha mentioned, my work is in nonlinear uh, equations. And athletics drew me this curve. And I'm like, oh, that's a beautiful nonlinear curve. I know how to handle these things. And so that's how I got really excited about this. All of my previous mathematical work in nonlinear equations can be applied to these kinds of curves to be able to understand time and development versus performance. So when players come in, they're sort of at some baseline out of high school. Strength and conditioning coaches get a handle on them, hopefully make a big improvement. Of course, they go home over the summer, they're gonna regress, and then when they get back into training, hopefully they can bring them back up again. And the goal is to get everyone up to their ceiling. Can we get everyone to perform at their, at their peak performance there? Of course, there's so many variables that go into this. So many variables. How fast are they? How much muscle weakness do they have? How much stress is on them? Do they understand what's coming? Is the crowd impacting sort of their thought process? Uh, age, previous injuries, how much anxiety do they have? Are they energized enough? There was a fun story out of the North Carolina State game that they went and bought hot dogs and bratwurst during the, the rain delay so that they could maintain the energy balance of the players when they came back onto the field. So do they have enough energy in their body to be able to perform like they're expected to perform? Are they getting enough sleep? Sort of all of these things go into, into this. And so what we're trying to do, and athletics is trying to do, is sort of balance all of these pieces to be able to get, that, get the athletes to perform at their peak performance. Okay, so a lot of my talk is gonna be based on uh, this article here from uh, Football Scoop. So Marcus Freeman uh, gave an interview with Football Scoop and he talked about how Notre Dame leaned into sports science this year. So the first year uh, maybe was a little chaotic in Marcus Freeman's first year, and now he looked back after the first year and said, we gotta make changes. What can we do on the science side to make changes? And one of the things they changed was they've reduced concussions by 50%. They drastically reduced other injuries and ailments. So let's talk about how these things happened. So the first is on concussions. If we think back to cars from like the 1950s and 1960s, they were like tanks. 
you hit something and your car was just perfectly fine. It just kind of didn't change much. Now if you get a very small fender bender, your car completely crumbles altogether. So the idea is the same thing with helmets. What you want to do is you want to dissipate the force of impact so that it doesn't go into the brain. And so these guardian caps are a way to dissipate force. They allow you to think about putting a pillow on your head and that's going to cushion, uh, cushion the impact. So it's dissipating the force. So when your car crumbles in an accident, the force is dissipated so that you're um, hopefully more likely to uh, be okay in that uh, accident. So Notre Dame really uh, leaned into using guardian caps. Uh, the NFL has mandated it for certain players. So the offensive, defensive line, and some other, um, other players in preseason. So the NFL data says they release, reduce concussions by 52%. The same thing happened here at Notre Dame. By using guardian caps, Notre Dame was able to match that data and be able to reduce concussions by 50%. So you see here, these are mandated uh, guardian caps in uh, preseason from the NFL. And all Notre Dame players have the option uh, to wear guardian caps. One thing that I've heard a complaint is they're warm. They, they add a little extra heat uh, there. So that's the only complaint I've heard uh, about guardian caps. But Notre Dame's data on reduction of concussions matches with uh, the NFL. So these are used in practice to be able to sort of soften injuries uh, from impact. Concussions in practice is actually more than concussions in a game. So being able to reduce concussions in the, in the preseason is a big, a big win here. Uh, the other thing about injuries is, uh, here's a quote from Marcus Freeman, I looked at injuries last year in fall camp and said, we have to do better. And so every soft tissue ligament injury uh, was decreased. And then it, the article goes on to say that this was based on health and workload management components. So I'll say a few words about those. And then Marcus has this nice quote that says, I wish there was a perfect science. There's no perfect science in reducing injuries because it's all about risk management. It's all about probabilities. We don't know who's going to get injured, but we can give a, a, a good guess at sort of the likelihood of an injury if they keep on this path. And so the perfect science is all about risk management. If someone is looking like they're more, have a higher risk of injury, you probably should change or alter the course there. Okay, and so the first question that's asked in sports science, how do you measure fatigue? How do you know if a player is fatigued? You want something that's quick, easy, and objective. So what people used to do is they used to ask the player, are you tired? And what's the player gonna say? No, okay, that is completely non-objective. The player is going to say, no, I want to keep going. I'm going to, they're trained mentally, have this mindset that, no, I, I, I can push through this. I'm not fatigued. And so you need some sort of measure, objective measurement that you can say, this player is fatigued. Maybe we should adjust their workload. And so what's being used is you measure jumps. So this is a, a counter movement jump. So this is Mike Zimborski uh, demonstrating uh, the jump for you. Uh, different players or different teams use different ones. You either can load up with your arms. Uh, some players, like at the NFL Combine, uh, just do hips. Uh, this is a picture from lacrosse that I found. They use a bar and then jump off of it. So these are what are called force plates. And this force plates are going to measure uh, velocity, uh, force, acceleration as they jump. And so as you jump, you get a curve that looks like this. So the first thing is, is you squat down, you're putting force into the plate, it's going to measure that. And then you jump up, and so you're in a flight, and then you smack down into it. And so when you smack down, you get a high impulse coming out of that force, and then, of course, you balance out. 
So this is what the uh, force plates measure, is sort of how much in this phase versus jump. The flight, you're not touching it, so it has no data. And then as soon as you come back down, you get this large spike in the force, and then as you balance yourself again. So you're measuring from these force plates how much velocity, force, power is being measured in their legs. And you can compare this over time. So how was it when they first showed up for camp? How was it after a week of practice? How was it after two weeks? And be able to compare their forces uh, every couple of days and see, are they going up? Is the strength and conditioning working? Or are they going down, meaning they're getting fatigued? If they're going down, then they're going to get thrown in this high fatigue bucket. If they're, ah, I don't really know, then they'll go sort of in a moderate. And then, you know, if they're doing what you expect, then, you know, maybe a minimal uh, fatigue level. So by measuring data from these force plates and comparing it over time, you're able to sort of understand their fatigue level. Quick, easy, very reliable. So these have been used for over 50 years, so this is not new technology. So very reliable. And then, if you're alerted, what do you think the athletes are supposed to do to recover? So what do you think are some ways that, that a student athlete can recover? Sleep. Sleep is number one. Sleep is the best way to recover. Okay, what else can you do to recover? Fluids? Hydrate? Ice. Ice? Yes, cold baths, hot baths. Food? Eat good food. Nice protein. Protein shakes uh, help. Any other ideas? Uh, anti inflammatory. Uh, so, one way to reduce inflammatory is by wearing compression pants. Uh, to be able to reduce the, the inflammation there. Uh, so here are some, uh, the top six ways that I, uh, that I found. So sleep is number one. Great sleep is the best way to recover. Eating healthy meals, avoiding fried food, eating, uh, you know, eating some nice uh, healthy chicken or some uh, other meats with protein or protein shakes really help in recovery. Uh, meditation, compression pants, doing some stretching or yoga also helps. So stretching out your muscles helps in, uh, in recovery. And then um, also doing contrast from hot baths to cold baths and, and vice versa uh, there. So cold baths are fine, hot baths are fine. You can actually do both. Do a little bit of cold, get a little bit of hot, and kind of go back and forth uh, from there. So if players are, are flagged as fatigue, then they have to uh, do some ways to recover uh, themselves back to uh, sort of normal uh, there. So this led to an amazing reduction in, uh, in injuries over the summer. So I see that John is here. So John is the Associate Athletic Director for Sports Performance, and John implemented this, and it's been amazing uh, there. So this only measures sort of total lower body. You don't really know where at in their body are they fatigued. It just tells you somewhere in the lower body something is going wrong. What we were asked is could we pinpoint sort of which joint is having an issue? Could we be a little more specific on maybe it's the right angle, maybe it's the left knee? Could we be a little more specific on finding or identifying where is this fatigue coming from? and then help to give more information to um, the strength and conditioning coaches from there. So that was our uh, research project um, that, uh, that we worked on. And so let me tell you sort of some of the background behind this. So Hollywood has been using motion capture systems for a long time. What they do is they put markers on someone, put them behind a green screen, and then sort of look and see how those markers change and be able to do a CGI, computer-generated image, afterwards. So Hollywood has been doing uh, motion capture for a long time. So of course, uh, sports science has also been doing motion capture, but it takes a lot of effort to be able to put these markers on people 
Athletes don't have time. The coaches don't give us time to be able to do that. So how can you get something that's much faster without having to sort of put markers on everyone? And so there's been a lot of new technology out there on markerless uh, systems. And so what this is, is, is you put cameras around. So this system uses eight cameras in a, around a square, the four vertices and then the four midpoints of the, of, the, uh, of the square have a camera. And it uses those eight cameras simultaneously to reconstruct a 3D image of the person. So this is taking in the loft of Loftus. So if you go over to uh, Loftus, there's a nice little loft up there. And we uh, took over that and used this as our science lab for a, a couple of months. So we set up the, uh, one of these systems up in, the, up in the loft. And then we had subjects come in. It picks you up as you're there. You do a slight uh, little bit of calibration. And then what you see on the screen here is sort of a 3D uh, capture of their, of their motion from sort of their joints. We wanted to test, is this reliable? Can we trust the data coming out of this? And then if it's reliable, then we can turn it over to the coaches and, and say, yes, this is reliable. You know, these, are, these are good measurements. And so in order to test reliability, we set up two systems simultaneously. So this is two systems all around uh, here and tested the, the two systems to see if they captured the same data. And then we repeated the test to see that did we get the same data in the, in the second run. Okay, and so this is Mike demonstrating uh, up in the loft of Loftus. Uh, it sort of looks like, you know, if we get someone that can jump really high, their head's gonna hit, the, hit this, but we made sure that we were far enough away that uh, everyone was safe. Uh, so this uh, markerless motion capture is, is currently in the Goog. There's a system that's been in the Goog for probably about 10 years now. Uh, it's already being used, and what we wanted to know is, is it reliable? Can we be able to test joint-specific data coming out of it to be able to identify where the fatigue, uh, where the fatigue is? Uh, our research was recently published in uh, the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. So here I, here I am, I, a mathematician by training, and I'm a first author paper in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. So I was, I was really happy about that uh, there. So yes, mathematics can impact uh, sports medicine. Uh, so we have this quote in our paper that reliably describing these joint positions gives us an objective uh, evaluation that can then be used for subsequent interventions. So you can look at joint specific things, get information about that that you can then use to be able to impact sort of who this person's right knee, this person's left ankle. And then we also go on to say, maybe the position coaches should use this for very specific things. So if you think about a defensive back, What's one thing you hear on the, on the broadcast on the, about defensive backs? Hips. So you always hear about defensive backs and their hips. Can we use this to be able to guide their hip motion uh, there? So that's one of the things that we, uh, that we also talk about in here as sort of uh, be able to project that, yes, this could be used to be able to give very specific position uh, motion sort of to guide the technical development on, say, hips of a cornerback. Uh, so this was, this was fantastic uh, work. It was a great collaboration between uh, ACMS and athletics, and, uh, and we learned a lot uh, from that. All right, time for a pop quiz. We're about halfway through, maybe a little over halfway. So I have a two-question pop quiz for you. First one, what are the top two predictors of injury? And then the second question, what's the top reason for missed games? Okay, so let's start in the first one. What are two ways to be able to predict who's going to get injured? 
Past injuries, number one. If you have a current injury, you're more likely to have that same injury in the future. So past injuries is number one. What's number two? No. You can't measure fatigue. So you have no data, you just have a person standing in front of you and you want to ask a question to them. So the first thing you ask them is, what's your previous injury history? What's the second thing you ask them? Your age. Your age. So of course, I'm on the other side of 40. I don't heal as fast as I did when I was 20. My age impacts my healing. The older we get, the more susceptible we are to injury. So previous history of injury. So I found this uh, really interesting. Uh, here was a soccer player, thigh strain, thigh strain, thigh strain, thigh strain, calf strain, hamstring, muscle, knee. Once you know one injury, you're more likely to sort of have susceptible injuries afterwards. So this was, this was sort of <laughs> very, very telling uh, here. Once you sort of know you got an injury history, it's a good predictor in the future. Not perfect, but a great predictor in the future about who's gonna get injured. And then also, also age. My 20 year old self would heal much better than uh, my current self. Okay, second question. Number one reason football players in the NFL miss games. Injury, yes, but what kind of injuries? Be a little more specific than soft tissue. Leg injuries, very good. So number one reason that NFL players miss games is lower extremity strains. Hamstring, quadriceps, abductors, and calves. So lower, soft, lower body soft tissue injury is the number one reason players miss games. Just behind that is ACL tears. ACL tears are catastrophic. So there was a current uh, cornerback of the Dallas Cowboys that just came out yesterday or day before, had an ACL tear, done for the season. ACL tears are catastrophic, but they really don't happen in the same quantity that soft tissue lower body injuries uh, happen in. Uh, data suggests that about one in four players in the NFL over a season will have some sort of lower body soft tissue injury. And most of them occur during the two weeks of training camp. So when they're just getting back into, just getting back into sort of football conditioning shape, that's when the injuries are most likely to happen. And then also punt plays. Punts are another reason. Anyone think about why a punt would lead to, say, a hamstring? Yeah. So usually you have a special team player coming off the bench who's cold, and you ask them to run 60 yards straight ahead at a dead sprint as fast as they can. So they come off the bench cold, run as fast as you can this way. Great, great reason for a hamstring injury. You need them to be loosened up, warmed up, to be able to do a full-on sprint. So pump plays are the highest rate of injury uh, uh, for especially lower, lower extremities. So because of this, we've put an emphasis on lower, lower extremity strains here. And so there was this article that the College of Science uh, posted about a month ago. Will math show that muscle form matters? So Notre Dame Sports uh, Performance and, and my department, ACMS, we joined forces with the NFL to be able to study hamstrings. So a lot of people ask, why didn't the NFL do this study? Well, they have a really strong union in the NFL, and players will not suscept themselves to testing. So they can't test their players, so they go to the next level down and say, let's test college players. And so that's why the NFL is partnering with universities to be able to study hamstring injuries uh, in, in elite uh, college athletes. Uh, so here's Casey again uh, running in Loftus uh, Casey was very gracious to be able to, uh, uh, to be our model for that day. So we have over 75% of the football players currently on the team enrolled in our study. 
So almost all of the players on the current football team are enrolled in our study funded by the NFL. And what we're doing is we're taking them to get an MRI. So we're going to measure their muscle form. So you can see muscle forms from the MRIs. You can determine asymmetry. Is their right leg bigger than their left leg? Or vice versa? Do they have one leg that's stronger than the other? Asymmetry is one of the main reasons for injury. You have a dominant leg that's sort of using all the force, and then your, uh, your other leg uh, causes issue. So studying asymmetry, and then also fat infiltration into the muscles. Is this really nice muscle fiber, or is there fat infiltration in there? So our players went down and got MRIs. Uh, the other things that they do is uh, demonstrate their sprint mechanics, so looking at their kinematics as they're, as they're running. Uh, so Casey, again, uh, demonstrating that. And then in the Goog, uh, there's what's called a Nord board. And so this is a Nordic hamstring curl. Absolutely horrendous to do. Very, very, uh, let's say someone who is not trained at this, it was not a fun experience to be able to do it once uh, there. Uh, but Casey is graciously demonstrating it, and, and Megan, our, our uh, junior in the College of Science, is uh, here monitoring things. So what you do is you put your knees here, and then there's hooks. There's hooks that go around your ankles, and those are where the sensors are at. So the force is measured from these hooks. So as you slowly lean forward, you're pulling up on the, on the back, and you get force measurements to be able to see how strong is your hamstring. And so you get sort of this, hamstr it's called the Nordic hamstring strength uh, test. And so uh, that's been used for several years here at, uh, at Notre Dame, and now we're putting all three of these together to be able to uh, to create an injury index uh, risk. So one of the things that people ask is, what does a hamstring look like? A hamstring injury look like on an on a MRI? And so here's a fresh injury hamstring that I found. This is not a football player, Notre Dame football player. I found this on the internet. What it looks like is a long cut with feathers coming out of it. So you get this wonderful long and then feathery uh, piece coming out of it. So these show up really bright on, on MRIs. And then uh, after, what happens with healing? So the first thing that happens is you get a lot of uh, fluid in that region. That fluid causes loss of blood flow in there. So you get this really big pocket of fluid here that gets trapped. And then, because of loss of blood flow, it doesn't, say, heal as fast as you would want and then eventually it turns into scar tissue there. So now a player who had a hamstring injury with this sort of long cut feathery now has scar tissue. And that scar tissue then is a predictor of future injury because now it's scar tissue and not muscle fibers. Uh, this is a 30, day, 30 days after injury. Uh, this was done at Wisconsin, Brian Heiderscheidt, uh, who we collaborate with. Uh, this player returned to play after 23 days. So this was the 30-day picture with this big amount of scar tissue, and the doctors decided already at 23 days they were well enough to go back uh, to play. So hamstrings take a long time to heal, and then they turn into scar tissue afterwards. And that's why once you get one hamstring, you're susceptible to more and more hamstring injury. So this is something that uh, we're really interested in, being able to predict. We want to be able to predict who's at risk of, of hamstring injury. So we're collecting data currently on this team as well as next year's team. So we'll have data from both this team and next year's team and then put it into our statistical model to be able to predict injury. Is it muscle form? Is it fat infiltration? Is it asymmetry? Is it strength, hamstring strength? What is the most reliable predictor? Currently, we don't know, and so that's why we're performing this largest ever hamstring study on, on college football players. Uh, the five uh, participating sites are here at Notre Dame and then down the road at IU, uh, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and BYU. So if you watch uh, any of these other schools, 
and they get a hamstring injury. On one hand, I feel extremely bad for the player. On the other hand, I feel really good because that's a new data point <laughs> that we can then be able to use to be able to decide. Okay, so Notre Dame, no hamstrings. Everyone else, get some good data so that we can then predict uh, in the future. So uh, the, no, uh, the NFL is funding this study here uh, at, at Notre Dame. And then we have partners, Springbok, and then uh, Australian Catholic University in, in Australia helping us uh, on this. So stay tuned. We still have this season and next to go. And then we'll be able to sort of hopefully be able to predict uh, hamstring injuries. OK, so that's too far away. You know, Marcus Freeman needs to know now who's susceptible to hamstring injuries. Can't wait for two years. And so uh, there was some uh, previous uh, study that showed sort of the relationship between the length of the hamstring, so the length of the hamstring, and then this uh, Nordic strength. And they kind of broke it up into quadrants. This is sort of high risk, this is sort of medium, and then this is sort of maybe low risk. We're not in the business of extending someone's leg so they have a longer hamstring. That's not something that we can uh, do. But what the strength and conditioning coaches can do is they can make it stronger. So if you have a player who maybe has a short hamstring, then you really want them to have high strength. So if it falls into sort of this region with, uh, say, maybe higher risk, then the strength and conditioning coaches can work with that player, increase the strength, and, and reduce the risk of, of injury. So this is, uh, this is what's currently being done because we don't have enough data yet to be able to, to do uh, better predictions. OK, and so now the last topic that I uh, want to mention about is uh, what's another way that we can measure inflammation that's low cost, quick, easy. And of course, if you have a fever, the first thing you do is take your temperature. And so what we wanted to do was we want to take temperature uh, using a therm thermographic image. This has been used a lot in horse racing. Horses can't talk, or most horses can't talk. And uh, so you can get a quick, uh, understanding of sort of where potential injuries uh, could be happening based on, on temperature. And so we're currently running this study. We started in the, in the spring with the women's soccer team. So they have sort of a, a spring season. They play a few games. And then the fall season is where the actual sort of conference and, and uh, NCAA championship is happening. So we started this in the spring. And we've been taking uh, thermographic pictures of them uh, pre-practice and pre-game. So I wanted to demonstrate this. So Samantha's going to be my model. We'll give it a chance to uh, turn on. Ah, perfect. On the wall. Yeah. OK, so this is a picture of the lounge in the women's soccer uh, right next to the locker room. So in the lounge. A player walks in, they'll stand at the wall, and then we'll take four pictures. So front, perfect, side, excellent, back, and then other side. Awesome. And then they go and practice. So quick, easy. And now what I want to do is I want to show you sort of what this looks like afterwards. So thank you, Samantha. OK, so they come in, they take their picture, they go off and go to practice. Of course. Go. Oh, there it is. Awesome. OK, I'll stop messing with the with thing. So they come in. They get a quick picture. 
we, uh, we measure lower body uh, temperature. And so there was uh, one picture, and then here was the back uh, to be able to see. So you got a little uh, heat around the knees, little upper uh, thigh region. But overall, Samantha, you're looking great uh, <laughs> on things. Fantastic. I'm glad that uh, technology worked. So what happens is, over in the locker room, we have trainers and students take the picture. They automatically glow, go into the cloud and are then processed from there. So it turns into this big collection of data. So you get this big matrix of data. Uh, I wrote a program to be able to then extract their legs and then be able from those legs to be able to compare them, look for high, uh, uh, high temperature regions, and then classify them also in, this same, in the same way. So uh, let me give you one uh, sort of, I don't want to say success, but one thing that we were able to, uh, to demonstrate that this is working. Uh, so this is a player. Again, I have no idea who pl what the player is. Uh, I have no access to names. All I have is a code number uh, there, which is fantastic. I don't need to know who it is. But this is their picture when they came back from sort of the summer. So they come back from the summer. We do baseline testing. No practice, no nothing. And so this is, a back, this is their uh, anterior. And so they're a little warm around the knees, but otherwise uh, uh, looking fine. And then a couple weeks later, here was another picture after they've uh, uh, done some uh, uh, games and practices. And hopefully you can clearly see the difference. Uh, this has long stretches of inflammation all the way down their, all the way down their leg. And sure enough, this player was complaining of muscle soreness. So it's a quick, objective, easy way that we can get data on the players. And the common thing that I like to say is the camera cannot lie. I think of this camera as like a truth teller. Players do not want to tell us whether they're sore or injured. But if we can say, well, look, the camera is saying, you know, there's some inflammation here. Do you think you have some soreness, or are you feeling something in there? Then they open up a little bit more and be able to share those things that the, then the strength and conditioning coaches can then uh, be able to work with them and, uh, and help them out to avoid a further, further injury. Uh, so I'm, let me wrap up. So sports performance is a fantastic uh, here at Notre Dame, ACMS is also a fantastic department. If you're not an ACMS major, you should be an ACMS major. Uh, but uh, together, we can work together. And that's really what uh, science is about, is building teams that work together to be able to solve problems. Uh, so with that, go Irish, beat the Buckeyes. <laughs>
I should have mentioned, uh, there was a quote up there, the best ability is availability. So being able to be at the game is the, is the key there. With respect to the models that you're creating, it seems to me that much of the input about a particular athlete has to do with, let's call it stuff like emotions, how much sleep they've had, what's going on at home, uh, you know, whether they've gotten a good grade or not, you name it. That's, That's right. right. How do you factor that into a model? Because it's very hard to know. That's the great thing about statistics, is we're trying to build models that can impact that. Uh, so Notre Dame players take fantastic classes taught by fantastic professors here. They have a lot of stress on them, especially during midterms and finals week. That will impact their performance on the field, without a doubt. They're, they're sleeping less, they have different stressors happening. So how can you build that into their training to accommodate for it? Notre Dame is sort of unique in that aspect. We are a high academic school. We need to build that into their training so that they are performing at the high level when they're on the field. Uh, it's USC game this year. USC game is at the end of midterms week. I am worried. <laughs> I am wor when the schedule came out, that was the first thing I looked at. Who's playing on midterms week? USC. So I am not making a prediction, but I am worried. And I hope that athletics is taking this into account uh, there. It was a, it was a, it was an egg last year on final, uh, midterm week. We played Stanford. We should have beat Stanford, but it was midterm week, and the players were just exhausted from that. So you have to be able to build in sleep. Sleep is the number one thing that they're looking at in athletics right now. How to handle sleep, measure sleep, improve sleep, so that you can get recovery. And the great thing about statistics is we can use all of these different inputs, put it into the same model, and see what comes out. Yes? I'm curious, um, when we talk about the team, um, are you testing that daily? Uh, so let's, let's examine the lacrosse team. So Notre Dame lacrosse team won the national championship this year. They were tested twice a week, every Monday and Wednesday. So every Monday and Wednesday they did force plate testing. And so they have twice a week data and then can be able to go from there. No, no, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So I asked John this question, sort of how do you force them to, and it's, and it's self-reported. Uh, so what they did was they built a point system. So athletes want to compete. Did I get more points than you on recovery? And so there's a point system there to be able to say, okay, I, I exceeded the points threshold there. Sometimes they can't go home and sleep. Sometimes they have to write a term paper or do other homework. So then how can you do other things at the same time? Maybe they wear compression pants while they're studying then and to be able to help. So it's all a balancing there. It has to get fit within their lives, fit within all of their other duties, but then sort of play on the fact that athletes are very competitive. And if one athlete got 15 points of recovery and they tell their friends, then you're going to try and beat that. Yeah? Uh, for many decades, I thought a person was supposed to stretch before the workout, but now I've read that it's better to like, start walking a little bit, a few blocks, and then do a few stretchings of the uh, calf muscles and right. the hamstrings. Is, do you agree with that? Uh, I'll, I'll turn this over to our strength and conditioning coaches uh, there, but absolutely, you need a, so that what the data shows is you need a ramp up period. You need to be able to slowly ramp up to things, get sort of blood flowing, get the heat up so that your muscles relax and stretch, and then be able to, uh, to go. So absolutely. But then you'll also need a cool down period afterwards to be able to uh, you know, worry about lactic acid and other sort of recovery pieces there. So the afterwards is about recovery. The beginning part is about injury prevention or injury risk 
reduction. The second, on delayed onset muscle soreness, is it okay to work through that and just be tough with it? <laughs> that's right. So that's, you know, that's a big issue right now is sort of, you know, you don't sort of see these things. So we're taking thermographic images and, and looking at 24 hours, 48, after, 48 hours after, say, a, a game. And you can sort of see the, the ramp up and the ramp down. Everyone has their own curve. Everyone is going to you know, have sort of inflammation on their own time scale. Some players, it'll take 72 hours before they're ready to sort of get back into things. So everyone will have their own recovery curve afterwards. And so what we're trying to do is individualize this. Get enough data on a single person so that we can then decide, is this abnormal or normal based on sort of their history? Yes? I believe your statistic was at about 25% of football players yep. are participating. Do you see, what kind of variation do you see between men and women and the different sports as far as? Uh, so, for the football team, uh, because they have to do an MRI, because they have to do these extra things, we got 75, about 75 percent, a little over, uh, participating. Uh, for the women's soccer team, there's a little different culture there. They love data and statistics. And so, uh, there was one player that wasn't, so all our data is collected over 18. They have to be a consenting adult. There was one player who was not over 18, so we said, sorry, you can't participate until you turn 18. And then, uh, um, so, uh, you know, the football players have their own mindset of what they want to do. And it's, everything is freely voluntary. We are, we are an external partner. We do not share this data with the coaches or things. We're just looking at this from a scientific standpoint of things. And so, just like every other person that participates, say, in the sleep lab here on campus, you're freely allowed to go there, and if you want to leave, you can leave. So. Thank you. Yeah. So, are you going to see the and male reaction We don't have thermographic data on, say, the men's soccer team. We wanted to pilot this with the women's soccer team first, because their coach was much more gung-ho about it. And uh, uh, Val, uh, uh, Val is sort of the strength and conditioning coach for the women's soccer team. And she has a PhD. She loves research. And so it was the best place to start. So let's start with the women's soccer team, get wonderful results, and then expand out from, from there. But uh, gender differences are a very interesting place to start. So you're, you're not looking at individuals and telling the coach, you know, John Smith's having an issue based on what we're seeing. And he's just saying, you're collecting a bunch of data points and then saying, we're seeing that this is the best way to keep all of your players from getting a hamstring injury? Uh, so on hamstrings, this is just, we are giving no feedback whatsoever to the coaches. So this is just observational. We're just observing data and storing it in our database until we have enough data points to be able to analyze it. But, but you are giving feedback to the players after? So af athletics is giving feedback to the players. Science is just collecting the data. So athletics has their own uh, way to give feedback. As a scientist, I'm just collecting data there. Now for this one, I wrote to the strength and conditioning coach at women's soccer and said, you might want to look at this player. And they wrote back, yes, we're aware of this player. <laughs> and so it was, it was actually a really nice conversation that we had. Uh, so we, we coordinate with the strength and conditioning coaches um, because they're the ones that are looking at, at injuries. And, and as a scientist, we are not. That's for the medical team to look at. Uh, if we're tracking injury history there. And, the, and as a scientist, I am not collecting any, because that gets into HIPAA laws. And so that's a whole nother thing there. And so all I'm doing with this is telling the strength and conditioning coach, this player looks like they're having a lot of inflammation in this leg. And sometimes it's, we know, 
Sometimes it's thanks for letting us know type thing. Yeah. Sure. This is a personal question. Yeah. Um, when you became a math major, did you know you wanted to go into engineering or did you have any idea? No, that's, this has been sort of a, a recent thing. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so I played soccer for 15 years uh, growing up. I've always been around sports and things, but sort of opportunity presented itself. We got great partners in athletics, and this has been a sort of relatively recent. I'd say um, May of last year sort of uh, time frame on things, somewhere in that range. Um, so ACMS has um, had a summer internship project where we take an ACMS student and work with a strength and conditioning coach to create like some sort of dashboard that provides them a quick summary of things. So that's been going on for about five years. Fantastic, yes. So we have one student that, uh, that was uh, uh, part of that Mastrovich project. So we've been doing that for four or five years and now it's like, okay, that's been great. Student, they like that. What more can we do? What science can we build now? Instead of, here's the data, it's like, okay, can we make new scientific discoveries from it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you study uh, concussions and soccer? Do they use your hand? I do not. I do not. Uh, again, this gets into HIPAA law issues on sort of injury things. And so it's, it's a whole nother issue to be able to do that. So let's end there. Thank you so much. <laughs>